stream. I'm Gina Bild. I'm the Associate Dean for Communications and External Relations at Harvard Medical School. Thank you for joining us here today. We're going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation, so certainly for those here in the audience, if you're watching us through the live stream, please write your questions in the YouTube and Facebook comment section. So it's that time of year again, right? It's time to support others through the season of giving, which you know if you were at our last talk in 12, we have many opportunities here at Harvard Medical School. It may be time for holiday shopping, and it's certainly time to think about how you can prepare yourself for the upcoming flu season. How many here have had a flu vaccine? Oh, this is, this is we have really good um, response <laughs> to the vaccine. That's excellent. Well, we're gonna be talking a lot more about that um, in the next hour. Did you know that one of the earliest reports of an influenza-like virus came from Hippocrates? Back in 1410, he identified it as a contagious disease from northern Greece. Over the centuries, as you probably know, there have been major outbreaks of influenza, with the first modern flu pandemic occurring in Russia in 1889. And that, of course, was known as the Russian flu. It reached the continent just 70 days after it began and ultimately affected about 40% of the world's population. I mean, think about that. That was before we had air travel and we actually researched this to make sure that number was accurate. 70 days it took to travel to the US. It wasn't until the 1930s that scientists finally isolated and identified the virus that causes flu and researchers began working on creating a flu vaccine. You may already know that last year's flu season was one of the most severe in recent history. 49 million people were estimated to have become ill with the flu last winter. Close to 1 million people were hospitalized with flu-related symptoms, re resulting in an estimated 79,000 deaths. More than 150 of those were children. If you haven't been vaccinated in preparation for this year's flu, it's not too late. There are clinics throughout the Harvard community and the Boston area where you can get a flu shot at no cost. Um, here's a slide, it will share, you can see where Harvard University sponsored flu clinics are being held and the website where you can access more information. And if you're interested in staying abreast of the progress of this year's flu, please visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention website. And that website is also on the slide. So what can we expect from the season's flu? How effective is the flu vaccine? As you know, last year's flu vaccine was not particularly effective. And we're going to learn more about that and why and how they developed the flu vaccine. And what are the treatments available to us? I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Karitskis. Um, he's the Harriet Ryan Alby Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Chief of the Division of Infectious Disease at Brigham and Women's Hospital. In addition, he's a member of the editorial boards for several science journals and serves as Associate Editor for the Journal of Infectious Diseases. Please give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you this afternoon about the flu. And let me add my uh, welcome to all of you uh, here in the amphitheater, as well as those who are uh, participating uh, online. Um, before I begin, let me just briefly uh, acknowledge uh, uh, some potential conflicts of interest. I consult for several pharmaceutical companies, some of which are involved in the development of uh, antiviral drugs for uh, the treatment of influenza. So. In this talk, I'm going, I know many of you are health professionals, and some of you have uh, quite sophisticated knowledge already uh, about uh, influenza and viral infections. But uh, in my talk this afternoon, because we have a much broader audience as well on, uh, through the webinar, I'm going to be uh, relatively uh, high level, and I'm happy to dive deeper uh, during the question and answer period if uh, I didn't get uh, detailed enough in my comments. So let's start by just asking, what, what is flu? When people say that they, they have, they've come down with the flu. Well, flu is a respiratory infection that's caused by the influenza virus. So the, the formal name for flu is influenza. 
And this is a virus that is transmitted from person to person by uh, tiny droplets in the respiratory secretions from infected people. And it can be spread not just because uh, you happen to be uh, near somebody when they cough or they sneeze, but often if they cough or sneeze, those droplets may land on a surface like a table or, uh, or, or, a, um, uh, uh, or a doorknob, and then you touch that surface and then touch your nose, your hands to your nose, your mouth, or your eyes, and those droplets survive in the environment. Uh, the virus survives in those droplets in the environment for a period of time, and that allows for the very efficient spread of the virus from one person to another and is why we see uh, epidemics of uh, influenza. So how do you know if you have influenza? Well, the symptoms of influenza uh, are, uh, in, in some respects, pretty uh, classic and in other ways uh, very much like other what we call flu-like illnesses. So the, the symptoms typically begin with the sudden onset of fever, headache, muscle aches and pains and malaise or just not feeling well. And these symptoms are often accompanied by cough and a sore throat. And what distinguishes flu from a typical uh, cold, a re general uh, respiratory infection not due to influenza, is first of all the severity of the symptoms and also their sudden onset. People really feel like they've just been hit by a truck and, uh, uh, and uh, can't get out of bed, as opposed to the typical several day uh, progression of feeling a bit of a scratchy throat and then a little bit of fever and a bit of a runny nose and so forth that is typical of having uh, a cold. And these symptoms usually resolve within about two to five days, uh, if especially in young, uh, healthy people, but can take a week or longer to resolve and occasionally can lead to more uh, significant complications. Well, what are some of those complications? The most common complication of influenza is pneumonia, and this tends to occur most often in high-risk individuals, and that includes people who have underlying uh, heart or lung disease, uh, people who have pre-existing conditions such as diabetes or kidney disease, and then the elderly, uh, and particularly those in nursing homes and in chronic care facilities. We also worry a lot about influenza in pregnant women uh, because they're, uh, especially later in pregnancy, uh, their ability to take a full deep breath is restricted somewhat by the large uh, 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 uterus and, uh, and baby inside that uh, uh, may uh, hamper clearance of respiratory secretions and, and predispose to more severe uh, pulmonary complications of, uh, of influenza. Well, how do you know uh, that you have influenza? How do we diagnose this? Uh, interestingly, despite all of the advances in laboratory testing, some of which are quite significant, it turns out that good old-fashioned clinical judgment in the setting of an influenza epidemic is just about as good as a laboratory test. So if in, in the middle of a, a flu season, if you have the rapid onset of the symptoms typical of flu, then there's an 80% chance that you have flu. And some of our rapid tests are less uh, sensitive than that at diagnosing influenza. So just a clinical diagnosis alone is probably going to be right uh, uh, in, the, in the appropriate context. Now, we do laboratory confirmation in, in many settings, especially in the hospital where we're trying to segregate people who have influenza uh, from those who don't because we don't want influenza to spread to other patients who are still uh, healthy. Uh, and nasal swabs can be tested in the lab uh, to detect the presence of the uh, influenza virus. And it's important to note that these are nasal swabs, not a throat swab. A throat swab is pretty insensitive for detecting flu. It has to be a swab that's inserted all the way into the back of the nose, not terribly comfortable, but, but very effective for diagnosis. And this, uh, the, the rapid tests can be done in a doctor's office uh, but they may miss up to half of cases of influenza. They're not terribly sensitive tests, and that's why I said in the right setting with the right symptoms, if, if it seems like you have the flu, you probably do, and, and getting a rapid test isn't going to help very much in, uh, in nailing down the diagnosis. But there are newer tests, more sensitive uh, tests that we uh, often refer to as nucleic acid tests because what they do is actually detect the presence not of uh, viral proteins or antigens, but 
a viral uh, uh, nucleic, the, the viral genome, the viral uh, RNA uh, by um, PCR-based methods. And uh, those can be done uh, it, usually in reference laboratories, often the, in a hospital lab or a commercial laboratory. And depending on how fast the sample gets from uh, the uh, uh, emergency room or the doctor's office to the lab, uh, the results can be back within uh, one to eight hours. So not as rapid as an office-based test, uh, but still the uh, test results within a day. On, in contrast to a lot of other infectious diseases, um, blood tests really play no real role in diagnosing influenza. There is no blood test for the flu. Um, sometimes a doctor might get a blood test just to make sure, to find out what your white count, is, your white blood count is, uh, but there isn't a way of diagnosing flu uh, with a, a blood test, so we really don't rely on those uh, at all. Well. If it's not the flu, then what might you have? And as I said before, the common cold, which is usually caused by a different virus that we know as rhinovirus, shares many of the symptoms uh, with influenza, but it's usually much less severe, especially the systemic symptoms are, are less severe. And as almost everybody in this room has had a cold at least once in their life, you know nasal congestion is really the, the predominant feature of what we would consider a classical uh, upper respiratory infection due to, uh, to rhinovirus, where you, you know, just your head feels uh, really foggy and cloudy because of uh, your nose is all stuffed up and you have trouble uh, sleeping. You may have cough, uh, uh, but that usually develops later as opposed to the early and sudden onset of cough associated with the high fever and headache that's more, more typical of flu. There are a host of other viruses that can also cause uh, uh, flu-like illness, uh, several of which occur uh, in epidemic fashion, like respiratory syncytial virus, or RSV, uh, para-influenza, which is very much like flu, and adenovirus, and we've seen adenovirus epidemics in the last couple of years. Uh, but these are much less common than influenza. Uh, they tend to occur in specific populations. RSV is much more of an issue in younger children than, than it is in adults. It can be a problem in immunocompromised uh, uh, patients. And adenovirus, uh, classically, we see in, uh, when large numbers of young people are put together, for example, among military recruits, adenovirus can be uh, an issue in, uh, uh, in the training camp. Well, this slide gives you a, a view of what the influenza epidemic was like uh, in the United States during the 2017-2018 season. And there are uh, several features that are worth uh, pointing out. First of all, uh, this looks like uh, any classic epidemic. It starts out with some low level of uh, sporadic cases, and then things begin to pick up. And then suddenly, there's this exponential growth in the number of cases that eventually plateau, and then things peter out. And if you look at the uh, x-axis here, these are weeks, and the weeks are numbered by week of the year. So we start out in the 40th week of 2017, which would be somewhere around end of September, beginning of October. And you can see that uh, here by December, things are really beginning to pick up. And the peak occurs around the sixth to eighth week. So uh, in, the, in February, we saw the peak of uh, influenza activity uh, in the United States, and then that uh, again tailed off so that by 20 weeks into the year, or roughly uh, end of April, beginning of May, uh, we really were only seeing occasional sporadic cases of, of influenza. The second thing you'll notice is that there are two different colors here, yellow and green, and that's because there are two major types of influenza that circulate in any year and infect uh, humans. They're influenza type A and influenza type B. Now, within these types, there are many different uh, subtypes. And I won't go into all the detail about the various subtypes. Um, but um, uh, we, uh, and it, the clinical disease caused by influenza A and B is really uh, indistinguishable. But because they are different viruses, the, the vaccine that we use has to contain components that protect against influenza A and components that protect against, against influenza B. And for the last several years, uh, many years, in fact, it's been typical that the, uh, the early peak in influenza activity is due to influenza A, as you see here, and then the later peak is due to influenza B. In fact, it looks like they probably coincided last year, but we've usually seen more acti B activity straggling into the spring uh, compared to influenza A. 
what was, uh, in addition to the very large number of cases that occurred last year, uh, some things that were notable about last year's epidemic were that um, the peak activity had shifted a little bit earlier into the year. For several years, we had been seeing very late peaks in activity with, with large numbers of cases still occurring in March. And this time, uh, the peak really occurred January, February, and then, as I said, t tailed off. The other uh, issue, and we'll talk more about that when I get to the vaccines, is that um, the, among there are usually um, several different types of influenza A that circulate. And last year, the type that ended up circulating was not the type that we thought would be uh, circulating. And, and the, the vaccine didn't do as good a job at protecting against uh, influenza A uh, as had been hoped. So how do you protect yourself from the flu? Uh, first and foremost are sort of basic principles of good personal hygiene. I mentioned that one of the ways that influenza is spread is through these droplets that can land on, on surfaces, what we call uh, the droplets we call fomites. And so uh, avoiding touching your hands to your face, your eyes and nose and mouth when you're in public, uh, and washing your hands uh, before uh, eating, and avoiding close contact with people who are sick with the flu uh, is uh, already an important way uh, of uh, protecting yourself against influenza as well as against other uh, respiratory infections. But really, the thing that everybody needs to do, and I'm so glad to see that uh, uh, the vaccination rate here was, uh, was as high as it is, is vaccination. And even though influenza vaccine is imperfect, none of our vaccines are perfect vaccines, uh, they do dramatically reduce the risk of infection. And not only will they prevent you from getting influenza, but by, by reducing the overall rate of influenza in the community, there's this uh, uh, herd effect where the more people who are protected against flu, the fewer other people who are likely to get infected with the flu. It's the same reason why it's so important that everybody be uh, vaccinated against measles and mumps and other uh, common uh, viral infections. And um, the, 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 uh, contrary to what is occasionally written about uh, in the popular press or on the web, uh, influenza vaccine is, uh, is extremely safe. Uh, uh, severe adverse reactions are extraordinarily rare and uh, the likelihood of ending up with uh, severe complications from influenza far exceed the very, very low likelihood of having a, a severe complication of, uh, of influenza vaccination. Now, uh, as you heard in the introduction, um, last year's flu vaccine was not all that great. Um, it was about 40% effective, but the effectiveness varied quite a lot depending on which component you were talking about. And so, uh, as I mentioned, there are typically a couple of different uh, strains of A that circulate. And last year, um, uh, the, there was an H3N2 strain uh, and an H1N1 strain. And I won't go into all the details about that. But you can see uh, here that the vaccine was only about 25% effective against H3N2. And since that was most of the flu that circulated, that's why the overall numbers are, are knocked down so much when you look at overall vaccine efficacy. But it was 65% effective against the other uh, influenza A, the H1N1 strain. And it was reasonably effective, about 50% effective against influenza B. So if you take the average of all those, that, then it turned out to be about 40% effective. So not great but certainly better than no protection at all. Now, who should receive the flu vaccine? Everybody should receive the flu vaccine. There's really almost never an excuse not to receive, medical excuse not to receive uh, the influenza vaccination. Uh, flu vaccine is recommended for all people who are six months or older. We can't give the flu vaccine to very young inf infants. It's not been shown to be uh, safe and effective in that population. Uh, so we don't uh, vaccinate uh, newborns. But after six months of age, then everybody should get the vaccination. Uh, it's also important to, to realize it's never too late to get the flu vaccine. We start vaccinating the very end of September, early October, as soon as the vaccine stocks are released and are on the, the shelves in the pharmacies. Um, but if somebody shows up in January and they still haven't gotten vaccinated, or if somehow you missed getting vaccinated and it's January or February, that's not a reason not to get vaccinated. Because if you remember back to uh, uh, the slide uh, looking at the epidemic, there are still cases happening uh, in uh, March and April and, and maybe even into the first week of May. And so there's no reason not to become 
protected, uh, even if it's already late into influenza season. Uh, young children who get the vaccine for the first time have to get two shots the, the first year, at, at least one month apart. And then once they've gone through that initial vaccine uh, series, then every subsequent year they only need to get the vaccine once. And for all of the rest of us, we only need to get the vaccine uh, on one occasion uh, each year, though. That's the thing. But because the flu changes from year to year, uh, uh, there are many different subtypes of A and subtypes of B. And each year, um, the um, Centers for Disease Control, uh, uh, through their surveillance network, uh, look at what, what kinds of flu strains are circulating in human populations around the world. And because flu seasons tend to be uh, six months out of sync in the northern and southern hemisphere, uh, they look at what's happening in tropical regions and what sorts of strains might be in the circulation. Then they uh, have an expert panel, the, the American Committee on Immunization Practice, uh, come together with the experts from the Centers for Disease Control and, and essentially try to guess which of these strains that are circulating uh, are most likely to be the dominant strain, uh, the epidemic strain for this coming flu season. Uh, and that has to be done uh, sometime back in the spring because then they have to tell the manufacturers which uh, strains of flu they need to start growing up to make vaccine so that by the time it's ready to start vaccinating, there are adequate flu stocks. So it's really a very challenging uh, uh, organizational uh, uh, and logistical effort to uh, first uh, gather the data, uh, uh, analyze the data, make the predictions, and then uh, have the, um, the companies that are producing flu vaccine uh, go into full-scale production in order to, uh, to get this out to the, uh, the public uh, in time for flu season. So um, once upon a time, it was really very easy to talk about flu vaccine because there was only a single kind of vaccine. And it was what we called the trivalent flu vaccine. It was inactivated. And that's because it had two A components and one B component. And the only vaccine that there was was the, that inactivated trivalent vaccine. There are now something like eight or nine different kinds of flu vaccine. There's a vaccine that has three components. And there's the vaccine that has four components, which we call the quadrivalent. It has an extra B component. There's a standard dose, and then there's a high dose. The high dose has more flu antigen in the vaccine, and it gives higher levels of antibody, uh, and in some, in at least one large study, better levels of protection against influenza in older patients, people over age 65. And then there's a live virus vaccine, and then there's a vaccine that's made in the laboratory instead of in uh, growing it in eggs and a variety of uh, several other different variants. And so uh, it, there's much more choice of vaccine uh, than there used to be. Uh, and curiously, although all these vaccines are approved by the FDA for use, there isn't actually a recommendation from either the CDC or from the uh, Committee on Immunization Practices on which vaccine is best for people to use. And so although there are some vaccines like the high dose that is, are approved only for certain populations, uh, such as the, the elderly, um, there's no recommendation that you should use the, the high dose vaccine in the elderly, that it would be inappropriate to use the standard dose vaccine. Likewise, there's the trivalent and the quadrivalent vaccine, but there's no recommendation about whether you should get the, the three or the four uh, strain vaccine. Um, at the Brigham and Women's Hospital, we uh, give out the, the quadrivalent, and I suppose uh, you could argue that if three is good, uh, four may be better, especially if there's another strain that could be circulating, but there really aren't firm data to argue that it's better to get the quadrivalent than the trivalent, and therefore no recommendation, because these recommendations that come out of the CDC are always uh, firmly anchored in, in available uh, data. So uh, the, since you're, you're already all vaccinated, it's a little bit after the fact, but for those on the webinar who may not be uh, vaccinated yet, the best thing to do is to check with your uh, physician or healthcare provider about which vaccine is best for you. Well, who shouldn't get a, va a flu vaccine? They're really a tiny category of people. Uh, so as I said, very young infants, infants uh, young, younger than age six, uh, can't yet get the flu vaccine. Um, years ago, some of you may recall, uh, this was, I believe, back in the 70s or early 80s, there was a, an epidemic of swine flu, and there was a 
big effort to uh, vaccinate as many people as possible. Uh, and a few people came down with a neurological uh, condition known as Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, uh, and there, although there's still a big dispute about whether it was or wasn't associated with flu vaccine, it appeared at the time that th this was associated with uh, the vaccination. And so since that time, anybody who has developed uh, uh, Guillain-Barre within six weeks of receiving a flu vaccine is recommended not to receive subsequent flu vaccines. That is a tiny number of people, um, probably only dozens. Uh, uh, people who have had a, a history of a severe reaction to influenza uh, shouldn't receive that again. That doesn't mean if you had a sore arm or you had a fever for a couple of days and, and felt crummy that that is a reason not to get the vaccine again. They mean if you had a really full-blown uh, reaction that uh, landed you back in the doctor's office uh, because of uh, an allergic type reaction to flu that you shouldn't get revaccinated. And again, uh, that applies only to a tiny uh, number of people. If you're sick, it's probably not a great idea to get the vaccine uh, while you're ill, not because the vaccine is going to make you worse, but because it will be hard to know what is due to the vaccine and what is uh, whatever it is that you have at the moment, especially if you happen to have a, a cold or, or a, a viral syndrome. Uh, and so it's better to wait a few weeks until you're better and then uh, get the vaccine. And then the, uh, another common misconception is that um, because flu vaccine is, is produced in eggs, uh, it's often thought that, well, if I'm allergic to eggs, I shouldn't get the vaccine. And that's not true. People with egg allergy can receive any of the flu vaccines, regardless of how they're manufactured. The, the likelihood of a severe uh, allergic reaction to flu vaccine just because you have a, an, an, an egg allergy uh, is extraordinarily low. Uh, and even people with severe uh, egg allergies can safely get the standard flu vaccine. It's just that in those situations, it's recommended that uh, the, the person be observed in the office for an hour or so afterwards just to make sure they don't have a, an immediate uh, allergic reaction. Well, what do you do if you get the flu? The first thing is stay home, please. Don't bring it into the office. Don't bring it into daycare. Don't bring it to your coworkers or your family. Stay home until you're feeling better. And the hospitals all here all have uh, policies uh, requiring that employees who uh, develop the flu and uh, stay home until their fevers have resolved and the symptoms have, uh, have gone away. Uh, and then, although this sounds uh, like um, a, a um, uh, uh, a cliche, uh, you should get plenty of rest, drink lots of fluids to stay well hydrated, and, and then use either acetaminophen or ibuprofen to treat the aches and pains and the, and the fever that may be uh, associated with it. But there is more specific therapy that's available uh, in the form of antiviral medication. Uh, and this, uh, these medications, and I'll review them in a minute, uh, really can shorten the duration of symptoms and can prevent serious complications of influenza. The trick about using antiviral medications to treat the flu, as with many types of viral infections, is you really need to take them early for them to have an effect. So uh, for, the, for the flu drugs, you really need to take them within the first 24 to 48 hours. And, um, uh, and then people feel dramatically better within, uh, within 12 hours after, uh, after taking them. And I'll tell a, a funny anecdote. Uh, last year, we, ha we have a weekly infectious disease conference, a Harvard-wide conference on Wednesday mornings. And last year, one of our um, uh, first year fellows, uh, uh, Amir Mohareb, was giving uh, a talk about the use of uh, anti-influenza medication for healthy adults. And uh, while I'm sitting there in the audience listening to his talk, I get a text from my daughter, who was then uh, 28 years old, saying, you know, I think I have the flu. What should I do? And I said, well, go see your physician and make sure you get medication for this. So she went. They took a, a nasal swab. The rapid test was negative. So they sent the test to the hospital for the, uh, for the uh, more complicated test. Uh, and then they sent her home. And then they called her up uh, at the end of the day and said, yeah, it was positive. Here's a prescription. That's the wrong thing to do. You would, since the diagnosis really could have been made clinically, you, if you think you have the flu and if your doctor thinks you have the flu, you should get the medication then and there and start it. You can always stop it if it turns out you really don't have the flu. But you want to get that uh, head start because you really have this narrow window to make a big difference in, uh, in the duration of symptoms. In contrast to antiviral medications, 
Antibiotics, uh, you know, things like penicillin, ampicillin, erythromycin, have no role whatsoever in the treatment of, uh, of influenza. Flu is a viral infection. Antibiotics treat bacterial infections, and so the two have nothing to do with one another, and there's no point in asking for antibiotics to, to treat the flu. Well, what are some of the drugs that we have in, uh, available for the treatment of influenza? Uh, the one that we've been using the longest is ozoltamivir, which is also called Tamiflu. And this uh, is a drug that can be given by mouth, uh, and it can be used both to treat flu and to prevent flu in a household context. And it's approved for use in any age group, uh, even in very young children and in infants. Um, and it, for treatment, we give it twice a day for five days, uh, and it's, it's highly effective. Uh, there's another drug uh, that's also been around for a while known as, called Zanamivir, uh, also uh, known as Verlenza. Uh, and, uh, unlike Ozoltamivir, this drug is very poorly absorbed, so it has to be given as an inhaler, uh, and that uh, makes its administration a little bit more complicated. It can also be used to treat or prevent flu, uh, but it can't be used in children younger than age five, mostly because they have difficulty really using the inhaler correctly. And it's not suitable for people who have certain kinds of respiratory conditions like uh, chronic obstructive lung disease or, or asthma because the, um, uh, the aerosol can irritate the airways and cause uh, a wheezing and, and coughing and, and so forth. So if someone already has that as an underlying condition, you wouldn't want to exacerbate that by administering the drug through an in, uh, inhaled route. And then paramivir, which has been available for um, uh, more, more recently, uh, is a drug that uh, can be given intravenously. Uh, for most people, there's really not a reason to use paramivir. It can, the one advantage is it requires only a single uh, intravenous uh, administration, but we do use it in the hospital if somebody is too ill to be given oral medication. It's very helpful to have um, the um, um, uh, injectable uh, form uh, available. Now this uh, fall, a fourth drug was approved for the treatment of influenza, Biloxivir, which is also called Zofluza. Uh, and this drug uh, is the first new flu drug to hit uh, uh, the shelves in, in several years. Um, and it's a really exciting development, although exactly where it fits in uh, is not yet uh, entirely clear. Um, one of the reasons it's uh, so exciting is it works by a completely different mechanism than the three drugs I just mentioned. And so if virus were to become resistant to ozoltamivir or to zanamivir, uh, biloxivir would still be uh, effective. In the clinical trials that were done, and they were published in the New England Journal of Medicine just at the end of September, and the drug was approved uh, in early October, uh, uh, biloxivir was just as effective uh, as ozoltamivir. It requires only a single oral dose, so that's an advantage over uh, ozoltamivir potentially. Uh, although ozoltamivir is now generic and so likely to be a lot less expensive than biloxivir uh, will probably be. Um, uh, biloxivir is also active, as I mentioned, against not only ozoltamivir-resistant flu, but also against other kinds of flu, so-called uh, avian or bird flu, that has circulated occasionally. And so one of the reasons to have developed this drug was to have it on hand in case we have a pandemic or epidemic bird flu um, and, uh, or... Um, uh, other uh, flus that we don't see uh, as often. <clears throat> Excuse me, but as I, um, as I said, because this is such a new drug, uh, it, ha it hasn't made it into the CDC guidelines for uh, treatment of influenza for the current season, and we'll have to see <clears throat> exactly what place uh, this drug has, uh, except in settings where we know that ozoltamivir resistance may be uh, circulating. So let me uh, end the uh, formal a part of this uh, uh, session by uh, summarizing that flu is a seasonable, seasonal uh, respiratory illness caused by the influenza virus. The symptoms usually include abrupt onset of fever, headache, muscle aches, along with cough. The complications of flu, uh, such as pneumonia, are most common in elderly persons and in people with uh, lung and heart disease. Influenza vaccine is safe and effective, and everybody should get vaccinated now if they haven't already been. If you get the flu, stay home, rest, drink plenty of fluids, and antiviral medication such as ozoltamivir, zanamivir, and now potentially biloxivir can shorten the duration of illness and should be started within 48 hours of the onset of symptoms. So with that, let me thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to answer questions. <laughs>
Yeah, yeah, sure. Say where they're from. Yep. Okay. Well, why don't I start off with a question that came from the uh, from Facebook, and this is from uh, somebody in uh, Egypt. Uh, are there ways to naturally stimulate the immune system to respond effectively to flu? Uh, that's a, a great question. Um, people have tried for many, many years uh, to find ways of, uh, of non-specifically boosting immunity uh, to see whether it helps to protect against uh, flu, whether it's uh, uh, the, through the use of vitamin C or uh, 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 what was it, acacia, uh, or um, I forget, the, uh, there are some uh, um, natural remedies. Uh, people have thought of used zinc uh, tablets, and nothing really has been shown rigorously uh, to uh, improve uh, influenza-specific immunity, uh, except for the influenza vaccine. Uh, so while people continue to search for approaches to uh, boosting uh, immunity more generally, uh, there really isn't anything that can be recommended now uh, as being effective. Let's see if there are any questions here in the audience. Yes, please. Um, do you need a prescription to stock up on the new one and have it at home just in case you get sick? Or do you have to get sick and then get a prescription? Yeah, so all, all four of the flu drugs that I mentioned are by prescription only. Uh, ozoltamivir has become generic, not over-the-counter. Um, it's an interesting question because of uh, how people get flu in the short time window. It, it, if there were enough... Uh, long-term safety experience with ozoltamivir, uh, it would act, in my opinion, it would make great sense to make that available over the counter uh, because people could then get treated right away. Of course, you want to make sure people are treating the right thing right away, which is a concern. Um, but uh, these drugs are all by prescription. Yeah, sure. Um, do we know if the vaccine administered here at the School of Public Health was the um, I have the word. Trivalent or quadrivalent? Yeah, quadrivalent or trivalent. Um, somebody knows. I don't know because I'm at the, I work at the Brigham and not at the School of Public Health. I'm sure the people at, at health services know uh, which one they were administering, but I, I'm not, uh, uh, I don't know off the top of my head which one was used. Uh, uh, and, and as I said, it, it, there, there's really no evidence that it makes a difference which one you get, which is why the CDC hasn't come out uh, strongly in favor. If, if they thought that the quadrivalent was better, there'd be no good reason to keep making the trivalent. And interestingly, uh, the high dose that's used in older people is only available as the trivalent. So it's uh, kind of a, a, an odd situation. Let's take another uh, question from, uh, uh, from the web, this one uh, from Mexico. Now, if I have already had the flu this year, should I still get the vaccine? Yes, you should. Because, as I mentioned, there are several strains of flu that circulate at the same time. And if you already had flu this year, it's possible that you had flu from one type of influenza A. But it, by getting the vaccine, you would still be protected against the other influenza A type and against influenza B, or possibly two types of influenza B, uh, if, if you get the quadrivalent. So there's still a good reason to get the vaccine, even if you've already had the flu this season. Yes? Uh, it sounds like the, desig the H and the N number designations are only for uh, influenza A, not for B. And so I'm wondering if there are similar designations for B, and if so, why we never hear of them. Are, is there more variation in the A than the B? There is more variation in A than B, but, but they, do, they all, all the, the H stands, uh, H and N both stand for proteins that are present on the surface of the virus. The H is the hemagglutinin, and the N is the neuraminidase. Uh, and these um, two proteins are the proteins against which the vaccine is directed. The vaccine induces antibody formation, uh, and, and these antibodies then neutralize the virus by binding to those two proteins. It's exactly the same for, for B as it is for A, but you're right. Uh, there are many more varieties of, of A than B, and so we tend to uh, categorize them more uh, according to the H and N types. I see, thank you. Uh, just that you mentioned that antibiotics plays no role in the flu, uh, flu uh, cure. So uh, I want to know if the infection of uh, flu virus would make people more susceptible to the bacterial infect. Yes, it can. Uh, so the, the question is, does, the, does influenza virus make you more susceptible to bacterial infections? And, and absolutely. In fact, 
uh, if, when people develop pneumonia from influenza, one of the things we worry about is that even if they start with a pneumonia that's due to flu, that their lungs can then become uh, super infected. That, that is, on top of the influenza pneumonia, they can now develop a bacterial pneumonia, and that can be quite severe. And it's thought that in the pandemic, the flu pandemic of 1918, uh, that uh, caused millions of deaths, that uh, a lot of the deaths were due to uh, the occurrence of bacterial pneumonia, either pneumococcal pneumonia or staphylococcal pneumonia, that uh, was superimposed on top of influenza pneumonia. But that's not a reason to start taking antibiotics. So you would only get, take antibiotics if it was shown that you had developed a bacterial pneumonia on top of your influenza. Well, wait for the microphone so the, the people listening in on the web can hear. Um, aren't the symptoms of pneumonia and flu similar? So how would you know if you have pneumonia? Uh, so that's a great question. So they, they are somewhat similar, um, and typically the way to know is, uh, is that a doctor would get a, a chest x-ray after doing an, an exam. So the, the thing is, so what's common is cough, um, but shortness of breath with flu is not so common, and chest pain uh, especially pain taking a deep breath, or bringing up a lot of phlegm, especially uh, uh, rusty colored f uh, phlegm, which is classic for pneumococcal pneumonia, is not typical of the flu. So there are some signs, but really um, the way to diagnose that it's actually pneumonia and not just flu is by chest x-ray. Yeah. So uh, why do people with uh, kidney, kidney disease mm. have a risk for complication? That's a great question. So the question was, why do people with uh, kidney disease? Um, so many times people who have kidney disease, especially if they are, um, have uh, advanced kidney disease where they are on dialysis or uh, uh, will have other uh, additional medical conditions uh, like heart disease and, and diabetes. And they're generally more susceptible to uh, various infections because they are, uh, they are in a generally debilitated state and their immune systems may not be functioning uh, uh, quite as well. I mean, there's a broad range, of course, of, of kidney disease, and so not everybody with uh, mild kidney disease is going to be uh, as affected. Let me uh, take a couple of questions uh, from the web, and then we'll go back to, uh, to the audience here. Um, so a question from Nigeria is, uh, how long does a single flu vaccine protect for? Uh, so the vaccine protects for a season. So if you get it in, uh, uh, in the Northern Hemisphere, if you got the flu vaccine in October, uh, you would be uh, reasonably protected uh, through the end of April or May. The reason you wouldn't be protected the following year uh, is because the viruses that are in circulation the next year uh, may be different. Um, the, uh, there has recently been a little bit of uh, concern about if you get vaccinated too early in the season, uh, might the immunity have waned by the very end of the season? So if you got immunized in August, is that too soon to keep you protected through April? Uh, but there aren't clear uh, data on that yet. I'm going to take one more um, from the web, and then we'll, we'll get to your question there. Uh, this one uh, from here in Boston. If you have the flu, how do you know when to see a doctor or be hospitalized? Well, that's a great, a great question, really very important. It really has to do with the severity of symptoms. Uh, and you, so you have to judge for yourself just how, how sick you are. If you uh, uh, have uh, fever and uh, aches and pains, you just feel miserable, but you're not short of breath, you're able to you know, get up uh, out of bed to go to the bathroom. You're able to, to keep things down in terms of uh, drinking fluids and having a little bit to eat. Uh, and you're, if you take some acetaminophen or ibuprofen and you begin to feel better for a little, bit of, uh, uh, for a little while, uh, it's probably OK not to have to go in to see the doctor. On the other hand, if you have really high fevers, if you're, uh, if you're feeling really awful and you just can't get yourself out of bed, you uh, have a cough that is now making you short of breath and you're beginning to bring up phlegm, uh, or you're having shaking chills, those might be reasons to, to go to the doctor, and particularly if your symptoms don't seem to, uh, to be getting better. So why don't we go ahead uh, with your question? Oh, OK. <laughs> Thanks. Um, what should you do if you experience flu-like symptoms after receiving the vaccine? This is from someone in California. Um, so it's not uncommon to have a low-grade temperature 
and a sore arm, or maybe even some uh, muscle aches. And the best thing to do uh, in that situation is just take some acetaminophen or some ibuprofen, and the symptoms will go away in a day or two. You don't need to, to seek uh, any medical attention. It is certainly possible, if you are getting vaccinated later in the season, that you get the vaccine uh, on Monday, uh, and Monday night you get sick with flu because you were already incubating flu, and it was just bad luck that you happened to have gotten the shot the day that you uh, came down with flu because you're in the middle of flu season. In that situation, if you really uh, think that you're coming down with flu, then you know you should call your your uh, uh, doctor and uh, and uh, discuss with them what the the best steps would be. Another one uh, from Colorado. Uh, do you have any predictions about how widespread flu will be this year? Um, uh, I don't. If I did, I would probably be in the uh, stock trading business. But um, uh, so, uh, no, I, we really don't know. It's hard to predict from year to year exactly how severe uh, the season is going to be. Uh, all I can say is everybody hopes it won't be as severe uh, as it was uh, last year. Sure. Um, so if a person gets the flu shot, what is the peak immunity, like two weeks or three weeks after the vaccine, when a person is optimally immunized, or is it shorter than that? No, it, it takes about two to three weeks to, to have protection, yeah. And take the question up in the back there. Do we ever end up to worry about antibiotic resistance, like with viral, so like antiviral resistance, is that a thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the question is, do we have to worry about resistance to our flu drugs? A a absolutely. So um, we used to use uh, uh, drugs um, uh, 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 like amantadine and rimantadine, which are a completely different class of drug for treatment and prevention of flu. They were never as terrific drugs as the ones we currently have, because they also had some side effects. And now all of influenza A that circulates is resistant to those drugs, so we don't use them anymore. Uh, several years ago, the H1N1 strain that circulated was ozoltamivir resistant. And so for people who developed severe flu, we were using either zanamivir or, or paramivir if they were, uh, were hospitalized. And that's one of the great things about seeing a new drug with a different mechanism. Uh, so now that we have bloxivir, if it, it became apparent that this, the flu that was circulating was resistant to ozoltamivir, we'd have a fallback drug. Uh, let's see, another, uh, another question here. Uh, should we be concerned about a new flu pandemic? Uh, I think people, epidemiologists uh, and public health officials are always concerned about the possibility of a new flu pandemic. You know, we live in an era of uh, globalization with international travel, and uh, something that breaks out in uh, one part of the world can very rapidly uh, spread to other parts of the world. Um, I don't think it's something we have to be nervous about. It's just something we have to be uh, watchful uh, uh, about. And uh, we would approach a pandemic flu in much the same way that we approach uh, uh, annual uh, epidemic flu. That is, make sure everybody gets vaccinated, use antiviral medications to treat people who are sick to help uh, decrease the period during which they're shedding infectious virus, uh, isolate people who are infected by having people stay home when they're sick, uh, and that would help curtail the, the spread of an epidemic. Um, let's see, is it possible or conceivable to develop vaccines without uh, using eggs? Yes, and this was a question from the uh, Chan School uh, here across the way. Uh, yeah, yes, the, the Harvard uh, T.H. Chan uh, School of Public Health. Uh, yes, it, it is, and there are, in fact, vaccines that are flu vaccines that don't require growth in eggs. There's a, there's a cell culture-based vaccine, uh, and there's also a, uh, a recombinant vaccine. Um, uh, those are sort of boutique or designer vaccines, and the real question is, is there uh, actually a role for those vaccines? Um, in somebody who has really severe egg allergy, uh, you might consider using them, but again, the CDC recommends that there's no reason even people with egg allergy can't get the standard flu vaccine. Uh, but, but, uh, and there are many other vaccines other, outside of influenza that are developed without uh, the use of eggs. Um, uh, you know, measles uh, vaccine, hepatitis vaccine, for example, is a recombinant vaccine. And then uh, lastly, um, what should you do if you experience flu-like symptoms after, re oh, I, no, I'm sorry, I answered that one already. I uh, got them shuffled. So one more question, yes, yeah, sure. Do you know why the flu occurs during the months that it does every year? 
Well, that is a great question. Um, it, and um, uh, we see a lot of illnesses that are seasonal in various ways. And the, the best um, arguments for why flu occurs when it does is that although flu is spread person to person, it's not the most highly contagious uh, uh, virus that we have. It's not like uh, measles uh, virus, for example, which is uh, incredibly contagious. So when people are uh, in closed settings, more indoors, uh, not uh, outside as much, uh, there's more opportunity uh, for person-to-person uh, -person transmission. Um, so it's not just influenza, but a lot of other things uh, we see more commonly in the wintertime uh, than in the summer, and they generally involve person-to-person uh, -person transmission like that. Um, there's some thought that maybe the uh, general stress of cold weather might have some adverse effect on, on the immunity, broadly speaking, and that could uh, make people more susceptible. Or, uh, and as you know, if it's a really cold day and you go outside, your nose starts running, so you're, you know, the nor normal clearance mechanisms that protect the respiratory tree from, uh, uh, from pathogens may also not be functioning as well in the cold as they do uh, when it's warmer out. Uh, but you can see epidemic flu in the summertime. Uh, several years ago, we did have an atypical season where there was a late uh, flu that occurred. It was most prominent in young people, especially adolescents and, uh, and young adults. Uh, and that happened in, uh, uh, in uh, June, July, and August. So, it's, um, uh, so we don't know really why, but we can come up with some pretty good explanations for why it might be. Hi. How do they determine the incidence of flu since so many people do not go to the hospital? Are those estimates or yeah, are those so, actual numbers and the actual incidence is far greater? Right. So um, uh, that's a great question. So influenza isolates are reportable to the health, local health department. So if somebody gets a flu test done in a lab and it's uh, diagnosed, then that's supposed to be reported to the Department of Health and they keep the tally and the CDC collates those those numbers and the, the data I showed you were for actual uh, uh, isolates, not um, not uh, cases of il of illness. But uh, in addition, uh, the CDC has sentinel sites around the country um, where they uh, uh, collect information on what they call influenza-like illness, or ILI, as they abbreviate it. And really, they are estimating what the actual num total number of cases of influenza uh, was in any year based on reports of influenza-like illness from these uh, sentinel centers and, and from health state, health, uh, state and territorial health departments that report to them. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thank you.